Are we live? Are we in? Yep, we're live. It's on you. Um, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming and um, jumping in here. Um, we're really excited to do this presentation on child protection um, in county jails and, and strengthening partnerships. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things. This um, was sponsored in part by the University of Minnesota Center for Excellence and the Maternal and Child Health Unit. Um, I, along with our directors, Dr. Rebecca Schlafer um, and Anna Lynn, lead the Minnesota Model Jail Practices Project here in Minnesota. Um, it's a dual partnership between the Minnesota Department of Health and the University of Minnesota um, with partnership also from the Minnesota Sheriff's Association. Um, so there's a lot of partners coming to the table and we're really happy to bring Stearns um, County in to talk about some of the things that they are doing. Um, and now I'll pass it over to Anna. Thanks, John. Um, welcome again, everyone. Um, we're really glad you're here and joining us in this conversation. Just wanted to give you a tiny bit of background about uh, how we got here. So we, in this model jail practices learning community, we talk about how jails and community partners can support children with an incarcerated parent. And one of the things that we've been doing with all of our jail partners is implementing parenting education. And there was an interest in ensuring that that parenting education also applied for child protection requirements if a parent had any open child protection cases. And so that started a conversation with child protection. And then we quickly recognized that lots of jail staff and, and um, didn't know a lot about child protection. And, and there was opportunity for child protection to better understand jails and how that operates and what resources they might have. And so this uh, conversation, this presentation happened about six months ago with our learning community. And we all we recognized that uh, this would be really valuable for other jails and other um, child protection or people just connected to those systems to try to build a bridge across these two really important systems uh, to support families, especially families with children who have an incarcerated parent. So that's what brought us here today. Um, I'm really excited that we have very generous presenters from Stearns County Child Protection who have given their time to do this presentation not only once but twice so that we could record it and offer it to the rest of the state. Um, so we have with us today uh, Nick Henderson, Will Wohols, Lacey Smith, and Andy Mesna. Did I say all those names correctly? <laughs> all right, and they're going to just take it over uh, and and share with you um, lots of details about how to build this partnership. Um, I don't know if John mentioned, did we mention, if you have questions, you can put those in the chat, you can raise your hand or you can put them in the chat and we'll do our best to monitor that throughout the presentation. Um, and, uh, but if you want to hold your questions, we're going to do some Q and A at the end and Dr. Rebecca Schlafer will be, um, facilitating that conversation. So thanks again for joining and I'm going to pass it over to Nick. All right. Well, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I am excited to be here. Uh, my name is Nick Henderson. I am the human services director of the family and children's division in Stearns County. Uh, we'll start with just some real brief introductions and then we'll go ahead and get started. So I'll start my presentation um, after we do our introductions. Um, I've been with the family and children's division about 18 months and prior to coming to the family and children's division, I spent the last 15 years working in um, community corrections. So developing a lot of the same uh, community uh, partnerships and collaborative partnerships with many of you who are on today. Um, just to ensure that everyone can hear us, um, because I haven't used WebEx a lot for presentations, so you might have to bear with us a little bit uh, with any technical difficulties that we have. Um, but if you could just put in the chat um, what county you're from and what your role is, that might give us a good idea of who the attendees are today. And before we also get started, one other quick um, note. Um, if you are a family and children's or child protection uh, social worker, I just want to be transparent about one piece of this presentation. The first part might be a little bit redundant for you. You may know a lot of the information um, because of your role, because we will do an overview of um, child protection. We feel it's really valuable for our public health partners, 
our jail partners, law enforcement partners, probation partners, um, and medical providers who may be on the presentation today. Um, so bear with us till we get to the end. It might be a little bit more redundant, but at this point, I will pass it over to Lacey Smith. Good morning, I'm Lacey Smith. I am one of our child protection supervisors at Stearns County Human Services and our family and children's. I supervise what we call our rapid response uh, unit. I have social workers in there that take our uh, child maltreatment reports, respond to the scene with law enforcement. Should there be a child safety concern, we try to safety plan and um, prevent placements or assist in, in finding placements. I also have relative search and parent support outreach and some assessment and investigators in my unit as well. So get to wear many different hats, but I have been with Stearns County for about 15 years and um, have done child protection case management, assessments, investigations, children's mental health, and been a supervisor in our child protection unit for about five years now. So welcome. Pass it to Andy. Hey, I'm Andy Mesna with Stearns County, of course. Uh, been with Stearns County for just over 20 years. Uh, in that time, I've done ongoing child protection. I've done children's mental health. Um, I've done investigations and assessments. Currently, I am supervised by Lacey Smith in the rapid response unit. I do uh, some of the rapid response responsibilities, and I also do intake. All right, good morning, everyone. I'm the last of the four, uh, Will Wackeltz. I've been with Stearns County Human Services for approximately five years now. Uh, before that, I did five years of uh, work with uh, adult foster care and in residential foster care facilities. Um, but I do very similar job tasks to what Andy does, um, intake, um, our rapid response type tasks, any sort of child welfare responses, assessments, investigations. Um, and I'll be doing that for about two more days here and then um, on Monday transitioning to a child protection supervisor position. And so I'm um, happy to be here and uh, thanks for the opportunity. All right, I am going to go ahead. I will start sharing my screen and our presentation. Um, hopefully folks can see the presentation. Uh, you can give, someone can give me a thumbs up. Let me know that you see it. There we go. Thank you, Will. All right, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, we will go ahead and get started with our presentation here. Again, uh, feel free to put questions in the chat. We'll monitor the chat as we go along. And uh, if you have a question that you want to take live, uh, raise your hand and uh, we'll navigate the function of uh, learning how to unmute you in uh, WebEx. So, um, all right, so we'll start a little bit here with child protection in Minnesota. All right, so as Nick mentioned, um, this portion of the presentation especially is, is um, for those child protection workers, which I saw there was there's several um, here today. It's gonna be a very broad overview and we're gonna kind of whittle it down as we work throughout the, the day here. Uh, but just a little bit about child protection in the state of Minnesota. It's a county administered system. So the state puts forward, um, the Department of Human Services puts forward um, the rules, the guidelines, those types of things. But the counties um, have the ability to kind of structure their um, system and how they enforce it, if you will, um, based on their community needs and those types of things. So between the 87 counties and 11 tribal jurisdictions, um, there are um, various different ways that, it, that it's employed. I will point out that there are some alliances within the state of Minnesota. So some of the rural counties will put together um, the resources to be able to provide um, the services to some of those rural communities. Um, and so you, they're, they're, there's a little bit less than um, actually 87 um, county um, administered or county uh, systems just because um, and then um, the state, as I mentioned, puts forth our guidelines and so child maltreatment guidelines. Um, it's a, a quite a lengthy um, book now that uh, goes over the five different areas of child maltreatment that we cover in the state of Minnesota, physical abuse, mental injury, threatened injury, neglect, and sexual abuse. Um, and within each of those, um, there are subcategories. So for example, neglect um, is not just a broad category of neglect, but within there could be uh, neglect due to drug use, um, neglect due to not providing medical care, and so these various subcategories that we have to look at as well. In the state um, of Minnesota, there's three different tracks that typically get us, um, there we go, uh, typically get us to uh, um, kind of get our foot in the door as far as if we need to respond to a child protection matter. Uh, family assessment is uh, 
kind of our lowest priority. Um, we really focus on partnering with families, um, trying to provide resources first and foremost. A family investigation um, is kind of a, that step up from a family assessment. There's more substantial child maltreatment that we're trying to look at and uh, making sure that we're protecting children. That we're really first looking at does mal did maltreatment occur or not? Um, and then also, um, you know, our services needed um, and providing any sort of support, um, just like we would in a, a family assessment as well. And then facility investigations, those um, we are responsible um, at the county level to investigate um, child maltreatment when it occurs in our foster homes, um, daycares, uh, group homes, those types of things. Um, in the state of Minnesota, we have this mandate to cross report with law enforcement. Um, and so law enforcement does the same thing with us. Anytime there's a, um, a report um, or a call for, to law enforcement uh, regarding a child, uh, child maltreatment, they'll report to us. We also cross report it to them. Reason for that is sometimes um, we work joint investigations. Um, sometimes law enforcement will have a criminal investigation, but it's not a child protection matter for various different reasons that we won't get into today. And then vice versa as well. Sometimes law enforcement doesn't have a investigation, but it's a child protection matter for us to deal with. Um, and so there's that um, good communication um, and we, we follow that, um, of course, closely. Um, then the out of home placement in the state of Minnesota, it kind of varies from state to state. Um, but in the state of Minnesota, the, the two ways that children are placed out of the home formally are law enforcement hold. This is paperwork that a police officer could fill out pretty quickly and that child could be placed on a hold and then uh, placed with a relative or a, uh, into a foster home or, or a shelter. And then there's also an ex parte order. And um, if you don't know what that means, or if you're not in the child protection world, it's kind of like a warrant to um, have a or writing up um, to a judge, you know, the reasons that a child needs to be removed. So maybe if, a, if the police won't place a hold on a child, um, we can go a different route um, and file an ex parte order that judge signs it, um, the family gets served and, and the child is placed out of the home for protection purposes that way as well. Move to the next slide, Nick. So, as I said, each county kind of has the flexibility to um, be able to structure their system as it works and best serves the community that they serve. And so, um, in Stearns County, we have the director, that's Nick. Um, and we have three child protection, traditional child protection supervisors, as Lacey described, um, rapid response supervisor. We also have our licensing department and our child and youth unit in our um, family and children's division. So, kind of a child protection division within Stearns County. Um, so that's the umbrella that that our county encompasses and in each of those units we have social workers and case aides and so this structure likely isn't going to look exactly like any other structure in the state based on our population size based on where we're allocating our resources or maybe a targeted problem that we have in our community that we need to maybe allocate more resources to um, it really can vary from from area to area um, county to county and so um, just wanted to kind of outline um, how we are set up um, go ahead and move to the next slide nick um, you know, as, as a child protection um, social worker and just our agency in general, and really in the nation, it, these are kind of broad, but current challenges are, are certainly present. Um, placement shortages is something that we certainly deal with. Um, a couple of few years ago now, there was some um, group homes that served a lot of our clients that just suddenly closed. Um, and so then we, you know, have to either find new placement for them and then any other child that comes into care that might need some of those um, specialized facilities, there's just less of them and less beds. Um, and it seems like lately we've we've um, had a little bit of a reprieve in this matter, but we don't really know. Are we just getting better with kind of piecing things together uh, because of the placement shortages we've deal, dealt with, um, or are there um, just a little bit more beds available? And so, um, of course, it ebbs and flows, just like um, any uh, any of your work as well. Uh, there's there's staffing um, issues that at times this is a nationwide thing, not just a Stearns County thing, not just a Minnesota thing. There's a high turnover rate. This is something that, um, you know, of course, we see in, in a lot of jails as well um, with the corrections um, staff. And so we deal with the same type of stuff. A lot of it's due to things like a high volume of cases. And like I said about the ebb and flow, you never really know how many cases we're going to get. The last couple of weeks, um, the amount of investigations and assessments that have come in have just been a crazy amount. Whereas um, over the holiday, uh, just this, you know, a few weeks ago on um, the holidays, you know, there's, there certainly was kind of an ebb and a, a lower amount of cases coming in. And so um, it's kind of, it's certainly a challenge to determine um, how many uh, cases are going to come in and, and, and where we need to allocate our resources. And lastly, uh, you know, we can be blamed for doing too much and blamed for doing too little. And I think this is the same in law enforcement, corrections, in the jails as well. Um, 
it can happen in the media. You know, when I say blame for doing too much, um, you know, a child gets removed from the home. Um, parents oftentimes um, in our world don't agree with it. Um, and, um, but there's lots of, lots of different um, people that go into making that decision. There's judges, there's guided guardian ad litems as well um, on kids remaining in care. And then also blame for doing too little. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've all seen, you know, in the media, there's, there's certainly times when kids get hurt um, or unfortunately die. And a lot of times blame is put on one or two people. Um, and again, that can be a, a really a, a big challenge that we face and contribute to some of the things like high turnover rate, um, you know, and all of these challenges certainly interact um, at a certain level. Any other challenges, uh, Nick, Andy, or Lacey to add? I'll just speak to the, you know, doing too little and doing too much. As I've worked in the child protection field for 15 years, we've seen the pendulum swing both ways um, with legislation and different laws and guidelines. And, um, it, you know, if there's a big event that's put out there in, in the media, then, you know, child protection needs to do more. And then there's a big event, well, child protection intervened too much. And so then we, you see the pendulum swing and we're really always trying to balance that. And I think um, child protection really does a great job of using some, you know, safety factors for for children and trying to get children with relatives and keep kids safe and really trying to be creative. And I think that part is not seen as well um, out in the media. And all of you that are here from child protection, you you know how creative we have to to get and to be. Um, so yeah, that is definitely one thing. I just wanted to talk about that pendulum swing. The only other thing I would add on, Will, is obviously this is a big legislative priority for this year for many counties. Is just our high acuity youth. Not only is you know have we experienced placement shortages, high turnover in staff, experienced staff, um, our high acuity youth. Um, as we come out of COVID here into what is our new normal, um, we're seeing aggression increase. We're seeing the um, acuity of the mental health increase, which is then leading to you know. Not only there might be beds available, but they're not always available or able to serve those um, clients that they used to because of either staffing shortages or just the acuity is too high. Um, and hopefully these are some topics that are gaining a lot of legislative traction, traction within counties, and hopefully we'll see some changes um, in the days ahead regarding that. Okay. So um, with regard to mandated reporting, you know. All of us are mandated reporters in the fields that we work. So I would say everyone here today is a mandated reporter. Uh, if you have reports that you need to make, those need to be made verbally to the uh, agency where the child is residing within 24 hours. Uh, and then we always ask for a written report as well within 72 hours. And, and I tell people the reason for that is we wanna make sure that we're not missing something. We wanna make sure that it wasn't something important to you that we left out. And we ask those questions, of course, when we're on the phone with people, uh, but it is amazing sometimes how people will say, here's what the report is, and then you get the report and there's a whole lot more to it. And, and really the reason we want the best picture we can have is because we're comparing that to the guidelines. So when you go back to the, the uh, too much or too little kind of examples, um, it has to fit within our guidelines. So if it doesn't, uh, we don't necessarily have authority to intervene. Um, failure to report is a crime. Um, not making a report or, or making too many reports is not necessarily an issue. I tell people, if you're concerned about something, make a report. It's not yours to figure out if it's screened in or out. It's really about just kind of covering yourself uh, and making sure that you made the report. And sometimes I think people will say, I don't want to make a report because I don't want to jeopardize this relationship with this person or whatever. But the thing that happens sometimes then is they'll make a report, a child, for instance, to someone else. Uh, and then, you know, part of that is we'll learn that actually they reported to so-and-so three months earlier. That, that means we've got three months of time where this kid could be in a different spot. So as far as common reports coming from the jail, it might be other parents is using drugs. Uh, it might be a pregnant inmate who's using drugs. Um, and obviously you guys get, you know, you monitor phone calls on jails and things like that. And um, say it, it never ceases to amaze me what people will say, even though they know their call is being recorded. So that's kind of with regard to mandated reporting. As far as intake goes, um, 
You know, we have two workers in Stearns County that are taking intake reports. And um, we also have an on-call system after 4.30. Um, those reports are, you know, we try to answer those calls. Otherwise, you get a voicemail and we call you back. But uh, essentially, those two people are responsible for entering the reports we get throughout the day. Uh, with regard to screening, uh, we review reports and we make the screening decisions based on the guidelines we've got. Now, the most current guidelines we have currently uh, are from like January of 21, but it's said, it's rumored that there's a new set of guidelines coming soon. Um, and I will say with regard to those guidelines, you know, everything starts out more simple and gets more specific as time goes on, right? Things only get more complicated. Uh, right now, our guidelines, I want to say it's like 99 pages. Lacey will know exactly because she has the paper copy that is like uh, well. 99. 99. Okay. When I started, it was 17 pages. And so um, there's a lot more specifics and there's a lot more to know with regard to does the report meet or not. Um, once we screen it, we'll assign it based on the track it fits in, like Will had said earlier, assessment, investigation, facility, that kind of thing. And then we're required to cross report anything that comes to us within 24 hours, uh, like law enforcement is required to do with us. Um, everything we get is cross reported. And the interesting thing I like to point out with this is for law enforcement, it's all about where the incident occurred. Whereas for us, it's all about where the child resides. So often that means we've got a, you know, kid who's at a hotel in the cities and Something happens there, but the kid resides in Stearns County. So we may do those joint investigations with um, a law enforcement agency outside of Stearns County. Um, and I just want to point out too with that, I know we talked about, or there was a question about um, the alleged offense or child protection matter when it's a criminal offense. Do we want to interview that person as well? Uh, I know that was something that was sent to us and, and definitely we want to interview those people also. Um, but often, if we have a joint investigation, we'll let law enforcement take the lead and we try to have them do that interview. Um, with regard to assessments, uh, this is you, Lacey, I believe, correct? Sure is. So once the report is screened in, it goes to the assessment phase. And Will talked about in the earlier slides about if it goes to an investigation or to a family assessment. But either way, we're working with these clients and children and families for about 30 to 45 days. Um, our main goals are to assess the safety. We have to determine if placement is needed. We're going to make referrals for services. We're going to collaborate with law enforcement and different agencies as well to um, access services. At the very end, we have to decide if, if further services are needed, ongoing child protection services are needed, no matter what track. So an assessment can't go on for months and months and months. If a family needs additional services after that about 45 day timeline, we need to pass it on to case management. Um, we are utilizing our child advocacy center and I know a bunch of child advocacy centers have popped up throughout the state. We use the central Minnesota child advocacy center um, through center care and they have a forensic interviewer on staff. They have a, an advocate, they have, um, Behavioral health as well, they're able to make some of our referrals for us. They are able to do our foster care physicals and a medical on site right away. Um, so that has been a huge resource for our investigations and um, law enforcement and um, child protection county attorney's office will all be at the table at our child advocacy center, which is typically used for investigations. And then, you know, in the assessment phase, we're doing a lot of safety planning. Um, we are, we really try to utilize a signs of safety approach in Stearns County and throughout the state. I know a lot of other counties are using that approach as well to really building off of families' strengths and how can we support them in those strengths to keep the families intact and keep kids safe still. So that is the assessment phase of um, the process. Uh, just wanted to give you guys some numbers of where our assessment numbers have been over the past couple of years. Um, so the orange line is the number of child maltreatment reports we've received. And then the darker red one is the number of assessments and investigations. And there was a little 
Oh, there was a little dip in 2021 on the assessments. Um, but I did before this meeting pull our um, numbers for 2022. And we didn't have time to update the slide, but I'll give them to you. We did, um, we received 2,681 child protection reports. So considerably higher than last year, um, a little over 400 higher. And then we did 747 assessments and investigations in 2022. So it went up from last year a little bit. And then as you can see, we're, um, according to the state data, we are screening in about 40% of our cases at this point. So when things go to case management, uh, we have a worker who is assigned. Uh, they'll work with the family for up to a year, sometimes longer. The court has the ability to extend that based on the progress that's being made by a parent. Um, our paramount goal is safety of the children, uh, but we are always working to reunify kids with their parents. Um, everything says that's the best place for kids if we can make that a safe place for them to return. Um, we do provide reasonable efforts when we're working toward reunification, uh, which includes like referrals for different um, services, transportation, visitation, um, urine analysis, uh, collaboration with monthly contacts, case plans, etc. cetera. Um, I will tell you too that um, one of the things that is not mentioned here, but I think is important is uh, with case management, we are working toward two things. We're working concurrently for permanency as well as the reunification. Um, and sometimes that is a challenge in and of itself because you're kind of working two tracks at once. And if you, you know, we have to communicate that to the client, of course, we try to be upfront about that. Um, but if they don't understand that, sometimes that comes across not good because they think, we're working toward getting their kids taken away or keeping their kids away when really we want nothing more than to get their kids home as long as we can assure safety. Um, and again, we utilize safety support network meetings when we do that as well. All right, so, um, you know, we've alluded to permanency here a little bit. I'll, I'll just expand on that piece of it a little um, after case management. Um, if we, you know, one of the ways I look at it is reunification is a form of permanency. It's probably the best form of permanency that we can get. So that's why we have it listed there. Um, but sometimes that's not an option. And so we have certain timelines that we need to abide by. We can't drag on a case for 10 years and because the mom is so close to mom or dad is so close to uh, making the changes they need. Um, typically, we have a six month timeline, but oftentimes, as the last slide indicated, um, we if the parent is working with us trying to make progress, maybe they're in treatment um, that can be up to a year. Um, that we um, work with them to try to reunify. If we're not able to, we do other things like a transfer of custody um, to a relative. Um, and so this could be an aunt or uncle, perhaps the aunt or uncle that they're placed with um, as a foster care option. Um, they might um, uh, be an option for transferring that custody. Um, we also do transfer of custody to the agency. And so sometimes, oftentimes we'll do this um, more with older children, maybe 16, 17 year old children, if there's no permanent, no uh, um, permanent uh, adoption option or a transfer of custody option. Um, and then also there's sometimes uh, parents have their termination, their parental rights terminated. Um, and so when that happens, um, oftentimes, especially with the younger children, um, babies, you know, up to one, two years old, um, those children will oftentimes get adopted. And this, this can be adopted into a um, relatives home, but it also can be adopted into a non relatives home. Sometimes our kids will go into um, non relative foster care and um, those can be permanency options. We call them, but the, um, they basically are telling us, yes, um, I'm willing to adopt this child. And then we have um, in the Stearns County, we have specific workers that get those adoption cases um, and they um, see that adoption through. So the case manager would pass it along to someone who specializes in that area. Again, just one of those nuances um, that we do at Stearns County. Other, some other counties do um, a similar practice. Um, and some of the smaller counties might do all the things from assessment, investigation, case management, all the way through adoption as well. And so that structure certainly can change from county to county. All right, so you've heard about our child protection process, but the past few years, really the state of Minnesota and, you know, Stearns County, other counties have really tried to focus on preventative measures to prevent families from going into child protection. 
So really the next four slides we have are, are talking about some services that are specific, some are specific to Stearns County and some are, are statewide um, about some prevention um, efforts to um, prevent child protection, pre prevent out of home placement, keep families intact and provide services. But one of those is our parent support outreach program. And you may be, hear it called the acronym PSOP, but our parent support outreach program is usually a, it could be a direct referral on our, our PSOP referral form, um, maybe from public health, maybe from someone from the jail, maybe from someone from the community school, or it's a child protection report that came to our, to our office, but then it got screened out. It didn't meet criteria for a child protection report, but we think that the family might benefit from some services. But it's a voluntary, um, voluntary in intervention. It provides supportive and strength-based services. It's really family-driven what they need. The state does give um, each county some funds to be able to help support families in this peace off uh, um, adventure here. But what there are some criteria, not everyone qualifies for peace up and it, there have to be two risk factors in a family. And we listed some there you can read, but really a lot of families have at least two risk factors. And the child, there has to be a child under 10 or younger or has to be pregnant. And so what we've really focused on the past past year or well, two years now is the prenatal exposures. We really wanted to focus on the, the pregnant moms that are using drugs or alcohol and really trying to work with them in the early stages of their pregnancy under a parent support out program or child welfare to prevent the baby testing positive at birth. Um, we want healthy mom, healthy baby. That was really our, our goal, kind of our slogan. And that also prevents some work on that end too. It doesn't lead, if they don't test positive, it doesn't lead to a new child protection investigation. It doesn't lead to an out of home placement. And so really, we're really trying to do some preventative um, focused work on the front end. And Lacey, I just saw, we have two questions um, in the chat. It looks like one pertains to PSOP and then the other one refers to our slide previous to this one. And so I don't know how you, if you want to handle the peace off question, which I, I, I can only see them pop in with my um, shared screen here. So I can read the peace off question. It's just, is that population focus a county level priority or state priority? So each county is given um, some peace off grant money and each county can decide how they want to utilize it, but there are uh, state guidelines, like we said, that there has to be a child under 10 and there have to be two risk factors. A couple years ago, we were seeing a lot of educational neglect type um, things coming in that didn't, that were like five unexcused absences and not meeting quite to the seven day threshold of child protection. And so a few years ago, Stearns County decided that we wanted that to be our focus. And so it really is county based on what, what the priority and focus is. Um, but I will say Stearns County doesn't just take the prenatal exposures. We definitely take other cases too that come through that we feel um, fit the parent support outreach program and the mission and have the risk factors. And then Will, do you wanna read the other question that was asked for the previous slide and then Andy can answer it? Absolutely. So are there ever situations where child protection helps to find relatives to care for a child when a parent enters jail? So the answer to that, I think, is anytime we have court involvement or, or we're involved in a family, we do have the option to work with our relative search workers. Stearns County has two relative search workers, uh, and they have uh, some programming that helps them to locate different parents or, or di different relatives, rather. Uh, and certainly that's been really helpful. We want uh, the state's preferences that we place kids with relatives. So if we're in the process of placing a child, and certainly all the outcomes are better for children if they're placed with someone they know as well. It's a lot uh, less stressful. Um, and, and I think in general, it really works well for kids. Now, when we have court involvement, those uh, relative search workers not only help to find uh, relatives, but they're required to report to the court. I think it's within 90 days of us starting our court process. Here's the relative search court report to say, here's the relatives we've located. We send out letters, we send out 
uh, things to just see who is in uh, a possible resource for these children. Um, and part of the reason that that started was because that we would have times where this particular parent doesn't want to talk to their sister or they don't want to talk to their aunt because um, their aunt maybe or sister is someone who's maybe holding them more accountable. Um, so they don't want to be involved with them. They don't want to talk to them about it, but that doesn't mean they're not a great option for the child. So we look at all relatives, absolutely. And so I think, I don't recall a time where someone said, hey, I'm going to jail, please find a relative to watch my kid. But if we're involved, um, then yeah, we have relative search workers that we access for that. And I just wanted to speak, the, the state does hold counties to standard of, I think it's 35.8% of kids need to be with relatives. And last year, Stearns County was over 65% of children with relatives. Um, I know a lot of counties are doing really well on this as well on the front end, trying to find relatives to place children with. All right, keeping us moving. Um, the next area that we're going to talk about is crossover youth. This is one of our multidisciplinary teams that we have in Stearns County. Again, as Lacey stated before, this is really one of our opportunities to try to get upstream. A lot of child protection uh, work that is done is, is reactive, right? We're getting the report. A lot of the um, incidents have already occurred, but crossover youth is one where we're trying to get upstream. Um, this is a multidisciplinary team with our law enforcement partners, education partners, um, community corrections department, our county attorney's office. Um, and this is where they're screening uh, children who are coming in uh, on a new uh, delinquency charge and determining did they meet the criteria to enter this program. The youth that are being looked at and referred to our crossover youth program are youth between the ages of 9 and 15. Um, and we know that there's some uh, potential legislative changes coming this year. It'll be interesting to see where it plays out if children 13 and under can be charged with a delinquency or go into secure detention. Um, that is on the table for discussion right now. Um, but this does target the nine to 15. They're a resident of Stearns County. They have prior involvement with the child welfare or our disability services system and are at risk of involvement with the criminal justice system. So these are youth that are coming in on disorderly conduct charges, theft charges. As we know, a lot of times when youth are committing the act of theft, uh, many times it's survival theft, right? They're trying to ensure that they have clothing, shoes, warm uh, jackets in wintertime, or sometimes it's also that survival technique of, I want to fit in, I want to find my place of belonging. Um, and so some of our goals with our crossover youth program are to reduce recidivism, uh, reduce the high risk behaviors, eliminate our uh, maltreatment reports, increase our school and community engagement, and then obviously improve the family functioning. Um, Will, I see that a question popped through, but I didn't catch it here. Yeah, Lori had just asked about does the term relative include the other parent if they do not reside together? And I, you know, I just had responded um, quickly that, yeah, that's usually our first priority is look at. If there's another parent that's a viable option, let's get the child with them. Um, of course, there's um, things to consider like distance. Sometimes, you know, if the parent is maybe in a different state or something like that, you know, I have to work on um, getting them there, that type of stuff. Um, and so, but yeah, I would say it, it, it would be a priority for um, our placement. Anything to add, Lacey, Andy? Um, well, I just want to flag a couple things that are also in the chat here then regarding that. So, Lori has a follow up question, right? So, does the non custodial parent have priority as placement there? And I think a related question that somebody's putting in here is let's consider, for example, that the non custodial parent is a father in a Minnesota prison. Are there um, opportunities to connect? Let's say a biological mom has the case come in. They identify a biological father in a Minnesota prison. Sort of, how do we is is dad um, the non custodial parent? Is he prioritized for placement? And how might that exploration of of his opportunities to parent and be engaged um, brought into the case planning? So, if if they are in incarcerated, I mean, well, we you know we wouldn't be able to place with them while they're incarcerated. But of course, we would include them in the the. Um, case plans, we would develop a case plan specifically for them um, and work. There would be programs in the prison or jail that they're in to be able to um, meet the expectations of that case plan and meet the goals that we have outlined. Um, and so, um, yeah, that I guess to speak to that piece of it with them 
as if they're incarcerated, um, but of course, if they're not incarcerated and they are, you know, th there's no safety concerns. Um, and, you know, again, distance and some other factors are, are all checking out. Um, that certainly, we would consider a temporary uh, transfer of custody to that non custodial parent. Um, that's typically how we would um, practice that in, in Stearns County, at least. Lacey, Andy, anything additional to add off of that? Yeah, yeah, just to reiterate, as as we are moving forward with a case and we find that the a father is incarcerated, the case manager, the child protection case manager, is usually reaching out to that prison to talk to the caseworker in the prison saying, hey, let's get a release of information. I'd like to set up a meeting to talk with um, that, that non-custodial father that may be in prison. And we are required to develop a case plan with that parent as well if they would like to be an option for their child. And so um, that case plan might include some programming that the jail offers, or maybe they're going to be released in 30 days and it could be some programming that would be offered after they are released from, from prison or any follow-up treatment or different things of that nature. And so um, we would work with them to develop a case plan, access services and whatnot. Sometimes it gets tricky um, just to be transparent. If someone's incarcerated for 13 months, that's their estimated time. Um, and our permanency timeline is six months to a year. It's really hard to, to utilize that father. Maybe I'm just using father as an example, um, as a permanency option, because our timelines are set by laws are shorter than when he'll be released. But that doesn't mean we won't, we won't continue to work with or make contact, provide updates. Um, we've tried to get creative even with some visits to jails and different things of that nature as well. Um, that also gets a little tricky as well, too. Um, but we, we do have the requirement to work with non-custodial parents and offer a case plan if they want to be considered an option for their child. We have a, All right. a state, a state with a relative. Yeah, so I interpret the question there as um, whether or not, so would placement be out of state with a relative or would different placement happen to keep a child in state? So I, I interpret that question there, Lacey, as is the prioritization uh, keeping the child with a relative or keeping the child geographically where they are? That's always a, a huge question for us, but I will tell you there's a, there's a, a very large barrier to even sending a child out of state with a relative. We have to go through an interstate compact for the placement of children, otherwise known as ICPC, and they are not quick. Um, I've seen some take six months to approve a relative out of state for the child to go to. But I will, we may submit, uh, the county may submit an interstate compact for a child to potentially reside with a relative out of state, but keep that. The child has to stay in Minnesota or stay geographically here. And then we have to weigh out the option then later on because some of the standards that DHS sets for us is we don't want the child to have to change schools. We want the child to be, remain connected to their community. These are our best interest factors. We also, if we are work, actively working with a case plan with a mom and dad, and part of that case plan is court ordered visitation, how are we going to do that visitation if the child's out of state? So we have to weigh in a lot of different factors uh, before we move any children out of state um, through our interstate compact. And one other thing that I think would be important to note, especially as we're talking about incarcerated parents, is obviously Minnesota has enacted the Healthy Start Act. Um, and this is for our incarcerated mothers who are um, in our women's prison down in Shakopee, those that are pregnant or postpartum. And the law uh, is the requirement that they place the women or the mothers um, who are pregnant or immediately postpartum um, into the community, such as a halfway house or in community alternatives so that they can have that healthy start uh, in regards to the bond with their child. Um, that law uh, was enacted in 2021. Uh, the first parts of it that we actually started to see coming into play and mothers being released as a part of it um, was in 2022. And I think that's a huge benefit, a huge benefit. Now, it doesn't necessarily apply to those that are incarcerated in our jails, 
But I can tell you from my experience working with our local jail and uh, sheriff's department here in Stearns County, if we have a pregnant mother who is incarcerated, uh, we are looking at all alternatives to returning them to the community so that they can be successful. Obviously, we do have to note that there are certain crimes uh, where mothers may potentially not be able to be released, such as murder in the first degree. I want to tell you add one other thing, and that is when we are looking at placement with a non custodial parent. If we've removed a child, our requirement is still to work toward reunification with the custodial parent from which the child was removed. And so sometimes we may have, for instance, in this case, a parent who is incarcerated, let's say they're going to be out in 30 days and we go, hey, we're going to be able to utilize this person. They're in a good spot. We can have the child placed with them. But we have to make sure that that parent understands we are still required to work toward reunification with the custodial parent. Um, and I think that can be really confusing because sometimes, um, you know, dad or mom who's incarcerated and has the child thinks, okay, the kid is with me now and look how good I'm doing. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're not doing good if we have to reunify with the parent where the child had been removed. And, and so just wanting to mention that because I know uh, I've had lots of cases where I've had a child placed with a non custodial parent and they do not understand why are you moving the kid from me? I'm not doing anything wrong. Doesn't mean you have to be doing something wrong, but it just means we have to look toward that reunification where the child was removed. All right, well, wonderful questions and great dialogue there. We appreciate that and to keep us moving through the presentation here uh, so we can get into the end and also make sure that we have time for question and answer at the end. We'll keep us going. Um, the other uh, another one of our pro proactive uh, multidisciplinary teams that we have here in Stearns County is our high run risk team. Again, this is a multidisciplinary team collaboration with law enforcement, uh, education professionals, our uh, county attorney's office, um, community corrections, and uh, again, we're targeting our youth again in the age of 9 to 16. And these are youth who have three or more run episodes in a 12 month period. Um, we're also looking for things as their sexual activity, chemical use, spending time with older adults with concerning behavior, mental health factors, and are there any suicidal attempts or ideations that are involved with the youth? Again, some of our goals of this group, which is uh, closely related to our crossover youth, is reduce uh, or reduction in recidivism. Uh, and also a reduction in high risk behaviors. We're looking at increased safety of the youth, um, you know, looking at kind of the sexual exploitation, um, the sexual behaviors, the high risk behaviors that they're engaging in, substance use. Um, again, getting them connected to their community services and our community providers, so keeping their ties to the community strong. And then obviously with high run risk, one of the greatest areas that we're concerned about is the risk of sexual exploitation. And so, um, you know, some of the youth that we're working with are also working with our human uh, trafficking task force locally as well, um, as that's a, a high priority for us here in Stearns County. All right, uh, we just wanted to talk really briefly about a new initiative that we just started in Stearns County. It's brand new, just got um, our feet under us, but um, we thought it was really important to illustrate to this team how much we want to collaborate with our community, collaborate with um, our agencies, law enforcement, jails. And so what we were seeing was, um, as Nick talked about earlier in the presentation, our high acuity kids, the kids that we're seeing with a lot of law enforcement calls for service to law enforcement, ER visits, um, utilizing a lot of different services, um, delinquency, truancy, child protection reports. And what we're learning is we're, it's harder and harder to serve these children from just a one lens. And so we really decided we wanted to open up our lens and really be collaborative and work with a lot of the agencies um, and services that these kids touch. And we really wanted to be all encompassing with families. So we are working with our, um, our family and children's unit, our adult and disabilities unit, our sheriff's office, our local St. Cloud police, our Claire's house, which is outpatient um, treatment for children, um, St. Cloud hospital, our mental health center, the school district, some of our mental health agencies and our crisis response initiative. And we are meeting on a weekly basis to discuss families that are touching each of these areas that we've we all kind of know these families' names and we were all 
in our little silos trying to help serve them. And we wanted to really wrap around for services to work collaborative with all of our partners and um, serve the ent entire family. What we're really trying to get is we want to prevent placement of these children. We want to prevent uh, court involvement with these children, delinquency acts. In fact, even want to prevent ER visits and really try to be proactive. So it's a brand new um, initiative. Uh, we don't know outcomes yet, but we're really excited about this and we have a lot of momentum behind it. So I just wanted to share. And so just kind of build off of the juvenile community action team. Some of you might be aware of some of the other initiative work that we did in Stearns County, which kind of led to this concept was our mental health initiative that we did. And that actually started with focusing on our high acuity frequent flyers. Uh, I believe the new technical term is those familiar faces. Um, those that are in and out of the emergency departments, in and out of the um, jail, in and out of detox, and also having regular frequent contact um, with law enforcement. These would be some of the people that if you're walking into a grocery store with your children, might be standing out in front in the middle of a mental health episode, talking to themselves, yelling, screaming, saying inappropriate things as people walk into the door that could uh, appear scary to the general public. And we really started to find and target um, these clients that were considered familiar faces. We found a lot of success working on the multidisciplinary teams because most people were engaging or working with these clients already. And it also pulled together the different ideas and perspectives. And many times, one of the things that we talked about at the beginning of this presentation was, you know, doing too much or doing too little. And um, with those uh, clients who are, you know, mentally ill, uh, have some criminal factors coming into play, the familiar faces, the systems were pointing fingers at each other and getting these system partners together and starting those conversations on how do we serve these clients better? Because this isn't just a law enforcement issue. This isn't just a child protection issue. This isn't, um, you know, a, a community corrections issue. These are a Stearns County issue. And really when we started to frame that, with our juvenile community action team or adult community action team, it got the buy-in from all of our partners and we're really starting to see some huge success. On the, on the adult mental health side of our community action teams, we already have seen a $1.8 million reduction um, in the services for those clients. And we're also seeing a more healthy and vibrant community, which fits right in with our mission statement. Okay. So we're going to move into intersections of child protection in the juvenile justice system. Uh, as you heard, um, Nick was talking about multidisciplinary teams. We're trying to do a lot more of that just because it gives us a better picture of what are we working with. Uh, and, you know, obviously the better the picture, the more clear it is, the more we can tailor those services or needs uh, that the, the parents, families, and children have. Um, Stearns County's screening team uh, meets twice a day to screen reports. Uh, we're required to screen reports within 24 hours. Um, and so we meet in the morning and we meet in the afternoon to do that, to make sure that if they meet criteria, we can get them screened in in a timely manner as well. Part of that uh, is because we have timelines for contact. If we screen the case in for a family assessment, we have 120 hours or five days to make contact. Uh, if we screen them in for a child protection investigation, we have 24 hours. And that's from the time that we get the call. So often we're screening, in, you know, on an additional times throughout the day, if we have a case that we believe as we're entering could be a 24 hour contact uh, because the clock is ticking. Um, we do this with a multi multidisciplinary team approach because we can have people from law enforcement there. We can have people from corrections there. Sometimes the county attorney's office there. Um, and as you probably are aware, our systems don't all communicate well. We use a system called SSIS. It doesn't tell us criminal stuff that's going on. Um, and likewise, law enforcement, uh, they've got all the criminal answers, but they don't necessarily know, know everything about what child protection involvement has been. Um, and, and part of the reason we wanna do that is again, we, we don't wanna make decisions on an island. You know, we want to be able to, um, you know, do that with the biggest uh, approach or the, the widest picture we can get. Um, and again, community corrections, they can tell us, are they open with the family? If they're open, um, you know, as Nick was saying, when we have multiple partners in the community that are open, uh, it's great when we can try to reiterate for each other, here's what needs to happen. Um, 
you know, we can uh, mirror the things that we're asking a family to do to what's already been ordered in court, uh, which also provides clarity, I think, for families. Like a parent who's got corrections, things that they're required to do, um, we don't want to make the wording all different and have them be confused by it. We want it to be clear so we can help them to make uh, meaningful progress. Um, I do see that there's, excuse me, a question in the chat, and it's just curious of who pays for delinquency. Um, sorry, delinquency placement in detention center. So this is actually kind of a unique question, and that's actually determined by the county. So in Stearns County, if we have a child that's actually in detention, it is our sheriff's department that pays the cost of that detention center. If we have a youth who has been court ordered into a placement, such as a 9120 secure correctional program at like Prairie Lakes, um, our community corrections division would pay for that. Now, I know that every county handles this differently. So some counties to the south of us, they actually have it where even their delinquency placements are paid for by their social services department. Um, so that is a county decision on who pays for those. That's just the structure of Stearns County here locally. So I would encourage you, if you're wondering about your local county, who is paying for those, it would be worth a conversation with the corrections department, the sheriff's department, and uh, the health and human services department. Okay. Um, and just one, I, I'm sorry, Andy, just one more quick thing, you know, regarding the multidisciplinary teams. You know, when we think of our families that we're serving, so if you have community corrections working with a parent or with a child and they have court orders that are in place, you know, really that communication is going to be important so that we don't have court orders or requirements that are really conflicting of each other. And for those of you um, who've tried to navigate things on your own, um, obviously us being professionals, we think that we can navigate the system. I have seen uh, professionals enter our system because of one bad night, one bad choice that they've made, and they've struggled uh, if they were convicted of or charged with a DWI, trying to navigate those systems, the requirements on the child protection side, as well as uh, their probation um, requirements. And at times there was even conflicting information in there. So that communication and that dialogue to ensure that we are all working together to help that client be successful on any multidisciplinary team is gonna be really, really important. There's also another question uh, in the chat. It says, are any staff engaging and supporting parents released from prison who may be re-engaging in supporting or parenting their children, but who are not involved in child protection cases? Or are you connecting parents released from prison with peace out? Um, I don't know if Lee here or- I think that's a, yeah, that's that? a good question. And I think, um, I think we would welcome at Stearns County a referral from a if you're a jail programmer or a, a case manager at a, in the jail, and that person is re-releasing and they're going to be involved in their child's life, um, you know, if they have those risk factors, um, there's a referral for just PSOP could be made. Um, Lacey, I don't know if you want to speak any further to that. We would definitely welcome a, a PSOP referral. Um, Nick, you may have to help me out on this one. Didn't we have something called a wrap worker? If I don't remember. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so Stearns County does still have a wrap program. It's the release advanced planning. Um, and so that's an opportunity for, you know, where our jail programmers would work. They would try to identify those resources, the strengths for that client. And when we get to the end of this presentation, that's actually some of the pieces that are going to be really, really valuable because at times I think our jails um, don't think of their role in child protection and how important it is. And actually when, when people come into the jail, it's actually, most jails don't ask that question, do you have a social worker? But they do ask, do you have a probation officer? Um, so it, it's some of those pieces, um, a lot of counties do have RAP programs. There used to be a community cohort of those where the um, local RAP uh, programmers or jail programmers would get together, they would talk about that. But really that is about getting them connected to the resources. And then also in our institutions, uh, if a person is currently incarcerated in prison, um, there is a lot of release advanced planning that goes into play. And if they are involved, like we said, we should be communicating with that person, with that parent who's incarcerated. And that should be a contact as well for that case manager who's helping that person reenter. And then one of the things that we're working on internally here is breaking down the silos between our divisions or departments and having that open communication with like our community corrections department. Because in Stearns County, if we have a parent, uh, a relative who is releasing back to the community, um, we do the supervised release portion. And so the more we can break down those silos and talk about this person who's going to reintegrate to the community, the better off we're going to be in, uh, being able to support them. And I think I saw some more questions here, so I apologize. 
Um, Will, if there's anything else that I'm missing. I think right now it was just uh, Deborah from Mauer County had just had mentioned that they created a new role for social worker to work with adults and parents being released from jail specifically. So um, kind of highlighting or echoing what we've been saying about different counties serving your communities the way that um, works for you by developing different positions and those types of things. So thank you for sharing that, Deborah. Yeah, and uh, just uh, one more thing to reiterate is actually not in our family and children's area, but um, the worker who has taken on this role uh, did previously work in child protection. So I think this is another barrier breakdown for us in breaking down in the silos. We actually do now in Stearns County through our adults and disability unit have a social worker who is embedded in the jail and she is helping navigate um, with the parents and also the services as well. Andy, I think I'm back to you, sir. Sure. So kind of back to multidisciplinary teams. Another area that we utilize a multidisciplinary team is through our Central Minnesota Child Advocacy Center. Um, and in that team, we're looking or we're working with the medical providers, the county attorney, people from law enforcement, uh, the child protection social workers. The goal there being to provide a forensically sound interview using that team approach in an effort to minimize trauma to the children that we're serving. And, and I love this because what that means is in the past, we might do our interview and then the law, you know, law enforcement would have done their interview and the county attorney would say, we need these questions asked for court or, you know, other people would come up with questions. And what we were discovering is often when there were high trauma types of cases, um, we were kind of taking them back, children back through that trauma. Uh, the great thing about a CAC approach is we have one person who's doing that interview. Uh, the entire team is able to watch the interview happen, and the entire team then can send those questions, make sure all the questions are covered so that we're not interviewing a kid, hopefully more than one time, uh, which, of course, is a way to try to minimize that trauma that they've been through. So I can't say enough about how awesome I think CACs are, but we're really fortunate to have one here in central Minnesota. Um, the truancy triage team uh, is the next thing. Um, and this is a team that started around the time of the pandemic. Uh, the opportunity was for staff from area schools to discuss cases involving troubled children. Uh, it's staff from schools, community corrections, office of the Stearns County attorney and public defenders. Uh, the idea is to work as a team to find resources to help children and their families. Then we go to crossover youth. And, and again, um, these kind of tie into some of the other initiatives as well. But the idea here is uh, Stearns County Human Services is working with the Stearns County Attorney's Office, Sheriff's Department, St. Cloud Police, school resource officers, staff of area schools, and the Central Minnesota Mental Health Center, Center Care, public defenders, guardian ad items. Again, this is a big multidisciplinary team. Uh, and we're discussing cases with regard to past services, current needs, community safety risk factors, behavioral information, strengths and needs in order to develop a plan for resources and services. And again, the whole idea there is how do we try to make these things as, as good of an outcome for, for families in terms of what services are gonna make the most sense? Um, not necessarily that we're duplicating efforts of other people and trying to do things you know, we, we've had, and as an example, we've had cases in the past where we didn't know corrections was open. Corrections is doing UAs with a, with a client. All of a sudden we get involved and we ask them to do a UA and they do the UA and then they tell us, oh, I'm doing UAs for corrections too. Well, we don't need to have them do twice as many UAs. We can have them do UAs and everyone can hear about it so we can know where we're at with UAs, right? So it's, it's all about trying to make sure that we are tailoring the need, tailoring the resources and, and things that we can offer to the client uh, in such a way that it is covering basis for other agencies there. And then just real quick before I switch to the next slide here, I did see that there was a question in there. Uh, does the court in your counties typically find good cause to extend timelines in a non ICWA case if the client was incarcerated for a period of time during the time the case was in ongoing case management? 
we have not experienced this yet, but I would assume that our court would entertain this um, from my perspective. If there's anyone else um, on here who maybe their court has, if you could put that in the chat, um, we certainly can uh, talk about that a little bit more. But Lacey, Will, Andy, I have not seen it from uh, my standpoint. But again, I think if the parties are communicating, we should know, you know, if we're working with our jail and our county attorney's office, we should know some of the timelines. Is this parent going to be uh, potentially released soon? The Department of Corrections, if anyone has a parent who's incarcerated in a prison, you can go on their website. You actually can see their potential release date, their early release date, um, and all of their projections with that. I would assume uh, in our county that um, if we knew the release date was coming, uh, they certainly would probably find good cause to allow those timelines to extend, or there would be some conversations that are had regarding that. And I think that you know, ultimately we're looking at when they look at when the court is deciding, do they extend or not? It's all about is the parent making progress. So let's say we have a parent who is incarcerated. They'll be out in 30 days or, or let's say it's 5 months. They'll be out in 5 months. We have 6 to work with, right? So it may look on the front end, like maybe there isn't a lot happening because they don't have all the resources for the uh, services that we'd like them to have while incarcerated. But if they're making progress and doing some of the things that their case manager has on their uh, list as well, we can articulate that to the court. We say to the court, here's the progress that's being made. Here's what's going on with that. And, and the court is very interested in trying to make the reunification occur if at all possible. And I think earlier we mentioned the timeline is, you know, up to a year, sometimes more than a year. And, and I think that typically has to do with the court going, hey, we have this parent who, you know, five and a half months didn't step up and now they're doing some things. We should, we should see where this goes, you know? So I, and Lacey, I think you were going to add something else, but I, I do think it, the possibility is certainly there as long as parent is working toward things. Right. I, I'll just reiterate that. I agree with that, but I also do want to say that I know that the courts really hold a high um, standard to permanency for children and looking at children's best interest. So we do not want children to lag in foster care for 16, 18 months while a parent's, you know, just to wait for a parent to get out of out of jail. Um, they, the children need permanency too. Their best interests need to be met. Um, so all of those things have to be weighed. I just want to be transparent that it, even if it's close to the timeline, it may or may not happen. I did see a chat in there from Adam that um, Benton County does good cause extensions for this. And so um, I'm sure it happens out there in different counties as well. All right, keeping us moving here. Will, I think you're up, sir. Absolutely, so I'll quickly touch on the intersections of child protection and the adult justice system. Um, just give a, a few examples just in my experience of how there's been some intersections. And so um, more and more often we're seeing domestic violence between uh, children and their parents. A lot of times this results in parents being arrested. Um, typically, if there's some sort of assault, they get arrested. Um, uh, a lot of times it's with teenagers. Um, we'll throw that onto our family assessment track. And so that's how we'll respond. We're really trying to partner with them and help them um, kind of navigate the services and the disagreement arguments that are going on in the in the home. Um, oftentimes, if there's physical fights, there's lots of lots of other issues that are leading up to those. Um, we work on safety planning as well. So how can we ensure safety for um, not only just little ones, but teenagers as well? Um, you know, it's it's um, even though they might be bigger physically than their parent or something like that. Um, you know, we still want to look out for their safety um, just due to their age and um, you know the growth and development. Do um, and so we'll do some safety planning. Um, and the next couple of slides, we'll go over Danko's. Um, and no contact orders. And I know a lot of you in, in the room know basically what those are. But Nick, if you want to move to the next slide, um, sometimes we'll sometimes a, a Danko will be put in place for cases like this. Let's say a mom assaults her 15 year old son. Um, there could be a Danko that gets put in place. I had a case probably was two years ago now, um, a little bit more than two years ago, um, in which they have put the Danko in place, which is just the blanket statement: stay at least 500 feet away from this address and this person, um, and, and that's it. Um, they're really stringent. Um, if you wanna go to the next slide, Nick, then sometimes we get these um, other um, no contact orders that are not the Danko version, but um, a little bit more flexibility to be able to do 
um, work on that relationship um, between the parent and child. And so this one is an example, it's a redacted example of um, one in which they should have no contact directly or indirectly with their child, the parent, the mother, um, but any juvenile, they listed that there's another kind of stipulation, any juvenile court proceeding may modify this order as it pertains to contact with the victim. Um, so this allowed, allowed us a little bit more flexibility to, um, to work on that relationship, get family therapy started, and then start that, you know, um, that, that contact a little bit sooner based on recommendations from professionals. Um, and so just wanted to point that out that I felt that this was a, a positive interaction between our judges, um, child protection, county attorney's office as well to work together, communicate on kind of how we can move forward in the most efficient way possible, yet still achieving safety. So that was an example that, that I had. Go, go for it, Nick. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, a few things to kind of keep in mind, especially if we have, uh, if you have some of those restrictions in place, whether it's a bank call, uh, OFP, which is an order for protection, uh, HRO, which is a hassle of harassment restraining order, or if it's just part of a release condition. Um, one of the things that's going to be really important here is obviously communication between departments, because if you are trying to work reunification, you're trying to do family visitation, and there's a dang call or harassment restraining order, an OFP or a no contact order on a probation violation, you don't want to force a parent to have those contacts without those being addressed through the court. So that communication, making those modifications occur is really, really going to be valuable because this is at times where the two systems, child protection and community corrections or, or child protection in the criminal justice system as a whole, really can provide some conflicting information, which can cause some anxiety for the families we're serving. All right, another intersection is um, our predatory offender population. Um, so in the child maltreatment guidelines, um, this is just listed as um, the sexual abuse that includes threatened sexual abuse, which is the status of a parent um, or a household member who has committed a violation that requires registration as a predatory offender. Um, so an example of that I had recently was uh, actually this last summer was where a 13 year old um, child, her dad was in prison, but in her 13 years, years um, even though I had minimal contact with dad, dad had been a predatory offender for 12 of those years, yet it had never been assessed or investigated. And so we were tasked with investigating it because she currently lived in our county at the time. Dad's in prison in Memphis. He'll be in prison in Memphis until child turned over 18. Um, so there's really no concern about contact. We still needed to assess that. Um, so one of the things that I had to do was still get in contact with dad, interview him, um, talked with the um, his caseworker there to see if, if they were aware, if they know of any restrictions, um, talked with his probation agent here um, through the Department of Corrections to see, you know, if there's any sort of restrictions for uh, contact, because um, all they were having and all they would have would be phone contact just due to distance and due to him being incarcerated. Um, but just wanted to point out that, um, that uh, you know, at the investigation phase um, with predatory offenders and parents, parents, even if they're not living in the household, if they are a biological parent, Social workers still have to have a ta are tasked with doing that investigation. More frequently, it's with a um, like a newborn child um, that 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 will see those. Um, this one was one that kind of fell through the cracks in the state of Minnesota and just had never been assessed formally. And so then we were tasked with doing that. It just happened to be dad was in prison at the time. And then, um, you know, we've really hit on the multidisciplinary team here and Andy really talked about the second uh, main bullet points, you know, compliance with the case plan and probation conditions. Um, so, um, one of the advantages is we can, um, you know, do drug testing just once overall and then have that information sent out. Mental health treatment, we can collaborate with um, folks in the jail or probation agents to see what would be the best course of action for mental health treatment instead of just one person deciding or all of us deciding different things. Um, Another thing that we um, alluded to earlier, but uh, that top bullet point of community, community corrections in Stearns County, the supervisor joins to provide information on adults in the justice system. Um, and that has helped us. There's a couple examples um, listed there, but um, that collaborative approach really helps us streamline our work and um, get things done more accurately, get, you know, ex exchange contact information, um, all of that type of stuff. And so, um, again, just really um, wanted to reiterate that the intersection between the adult justice system and child protection, that multidisciplinary team, um, is there's a huge advantage to doing it. All right, so as we start to wrap up our presentation, we'll have some time for questions, but um, 
how do we collaborate together? How does child protection and the jails collaborate together? And we wanted to give you um, all some reasons why there may be intersections or what it might look like. Um, and some of the reasons why social workers may visit the jail is on that child protection assessment or investigation. If we have an incarcerated parent, that social worker has to interview that parent. And if that parent is incarcerated, we need to go to the jail to be able to complete our, our adult interview. And um, so that would include sometimes being um, audio recorded as well. And so I know sometimes we've had to get um, permission from the jail to bring in our audio recording devices. And so those are some things that, you know, the jail should be aware of when our social workers come in. Um, sometimes case managers need to meet with um, to meet with uh, people in jail as in regards to signing releases, to signing case plans, different things of that nature. Also, a lot of our programs may complement each other. So when when parents are, if there's an incarcerated parent and they're working a case plan and they're in jail, maybe there's some programs that they can complete in jail that would satisfy part of their case plan. And so really that communication would be helpful to know, hey, they took a parenting class in while they were in jail and here's their certificate. And so we can work collaboratively together to get that information to really help that parent succeed in the long run on their case plan. Another thing are parent-child visits. Um, we also, with COVID, need to be creative as well about some video visits and different things of that nature. And so we want to keep children connected to their parents, even if they are incarcerated. Um, I know there are some barriers to that, but if we can collaborate and work together and talk about different things and try to brainstorm, I think that is um, the best idea. And then, as Nick mentioned earlier, um, a lot of times on the jail intake, um, they're asked, do you have a probation agent? Um, also, on one thing you could ask is, do you have a social worker? Because that's probably just as important. Um, and a, for a lot of these parents that are incarcerated, their children are very important to them. And so we can start right away on the front end to try to collaborate and get information back and forth together. Um, and then mandated reporter training. We have um, historically provided mandated reporter training for the community. We would love to go into the jails, um, provide uh, a specific mandated reporter training on what to report, what's in our guidelines, a little bit more detailed than what we ta than Will talked about earlier. And really just the goal of having integrated systems. Um, so we know that all of the clients that we touch really touch all of our, our systems and our partners. They might be involved with public health, child protection, corrections. I mean, all of these cross paths and we really shouldn't um, look at, as I mentioned before on our JCAT, look at it from a one focus lens, really open, open that up wider. So those are some of the ways that child protection and the jail can collaborate. Um, any other thoughts from our panel? Yeah, I just have a few uh, quick comments regarding this. You know, obviously uh, knowledge is power um, and that's one of the most important things. I think, um, you know, expanding those relationships. If your county, you know, doesn't have that strong working relationship with your jail, setting up regular meetings, communicating, educating each other, ha ensuring that like child protection understands the jail, their policies, procedures, right? At times it can feel like our jails are all about safety and security. That is their number one priority. But we also have fantastic human beings who are working inside of our jails. They have a lot of relationship building that they do. There's a lot of strengths that they also find and build off of the inmates. And so they have a lot of knowledge and a lot of power uh, that can be shared with the child protection agency there, you know, in their daily interactions that they have with the inmates. So sometimes the officers feel like they don't have those pieces and actually they may play one of the most important roles in building that relationship with the inmate, building the relationship so that they can be successful, getting them to buy into programming that's in the jails. The other part of having those open lines of communication and collaborating a lot more with your jail is going to build those relationships. It's going to build those relationships for, hey, maybe we have these programs and these programs aren't building or meeting the needs of our clients. And so how can we talk about, you know, implementing, bringing new programs in, programs that can support all of the systems versus just being focused on either child protection or the jails? Um, I think, you know, in Stearns County, we're really, really um, fortunate um, that we have a progressive sheriff's department. We have a progressive child protection agency where we are constantly looking at, hey, how can we tear down these silos? How can we work together and really work for the benefit of our clients? Yes, they are incarcerated. Yes, they maybe had a dark day and a dark moment in their lives, 
but how can we support them in being successful? Because that one dark day and that one dark moment that they had doesn't define who they are. Um, so those are just some thoughts from my end. Other thoughts, Lacey, Will, Andy? I just wanted to say it. Um, one of the things too, that as Nick talks about relationships in the remote world that we are in, sometimes it's great to just meet someone face to face. And so, you know, an idea that, you know, was thrown out on is have child protection workers come to a jail visit, meet the jail staff, meet each other. Like I mentioned before, have child protection come to a mandated reporter training, meet people face to face. It's a lot, it's a lot easier to respond to somebody when you've met them and built a connection than a complete stranger. And we want to be responsive and customer service oriented and working together. Um, and I, I just really build up like, those relationships are very important. I would echo that. I think, you know, um, not even not even only when you have a case together, but sometimes it's like, who do I reach out to at this place when I have this question? Those connections are huge, and I and I think um, that really can go a long way for our clients. So that's good stuff. All right, we'll move into um, a little bit of question and answer session here. Um, so we will open it up to the group. Um, and also uh, following this, um, John Esham, uh, who was on here earlier, um, introduced himself, has created a wonderful um, document that will be um, emailed out to everybody. I'm gonna see if I can just share this form real quick. So bear with me here one second, folks. But if others have, um, you know, questions, discussion topics that they would like to bring up. I'll be honest, this uh, last time we did this presentation down in Sherburne County, this is where the meat and potatoes of the presentation came out. This is where those difficult questions were be able to be asked and answered, um, but we can certainly begin that. But I'm just gonna share the document that John uh, will email out to everybody here. Let me get my screen switched around. That's great, Nick. And also, I just included in the um, chat, there's a survey uh, that we'd like to fill out just to make sure that we keep connected and, um, and take some next steps there, too. Thanks. All right, so hopefully everyone can see um, this uh, Minnesota Department of Health and University of Minnesota um, document on the screen. Um, I will try to make it a little bit larger because I know sometimes in these environments um, it's there. Just, uh, you know, obviously the concept of building a partnership, partnerships are really, really important. Create opportunities for regular cross uh, agency collaborative meetings. You know, try to designate, do you have a point of contact, a main person to contact? Like for us, many times we'll go to Sergeant Owner in the Stearns County Jail. He's a main point of contact. Uh, he's kind of a jack of all trades, knows uh, many different things. Um, you know, encourage your agencies as you're working collaboratively together to, you know, include questions at intake, such as do you have a social worker, um, you know, and create those cross partnerships. Um, co coordinate an, an orientation to an in person jail visit for new child protection staff. It's important for our staff to have understanding, but not only is it important there, it's going to be important for the jail staff to have a good understanding um, of the of the role of child protection, what we can do, what we can't do, because sometimes there's a lot of misinformation, and a lot of misnomers. Um, review our current practices and policies together. Um, child protection in jails should, you know, consider partnering together with local community providers who can offer culturally and linguistically specific supplemental services to support parents and children. And then um, just real quick to kind of go through what child protection can do. We can also have a point of contact as kind of a jail liaison to assist them in navigating. Sometimes for outside uh, external partners, it can seem like they go into a world of being transferred, transferred, not knowing who to call. Do I get, did I get to the right place? Um, ensure that they have relevant information to understand the cases. They understand what the jail offers for incarcerated parents. So make sure that we are aware of the programs. I think at times we're not aware of everything that is happening within the jails or the programs that they have. Um, talk to family about why it's important to talk to a child about a parent who's incarcerated and how to approach that conversation. Those can be tricky conversations for parents and families to navigate if they've never had to navigate it before. 
Um, and then obviously support family visits of our incarcerated parents. So prepare the families for what they can expect during a visit, provide a space for a video visit, or after the visit, make sure that we're checking in with the families. And then real quickly getting down to what can the jails do, you know, make sure that they're having regular reach outs with child protection. Work with, if you don't have a space, if you don't have the technology or the capabilities to allow for supervised contacts, provide that space, find alternatives, work through the barriers, lead with yes. Uh, provide program participation information for child protection. Um, notify the family and the child protection liaison of you know ways like if, if visitation is canceled. Right, we have inmates. Sometimes they have a good day in jail, and sometimes they have a bad day while they're incarcerated. They might lose their privileges, so don't leave people hanging and waiting. Make sure they're aware of all of that they can expect when they come into the jail. Many people don't understand. Even myself and our staff at times will struggle. Hey, why can't I bring my keys into the jail? Uh, why do I have to lock my keys up? You know, basically we need to leave everything other than the materials that are approved by the jail for our visits. Uh, make sure that we're prioritizing visits based on the needs of the parent, based on the needs of the case, and that's where communication is going to be important. And then also making sure that we create a friendly, uh, a child friendly environment. Uh, jail environment isn't isn't uh, family friendly. The clinging of the keys, the slamming of the doors, the loud noises. It's going to be important if you're able to do those to navigate that. Um, and then, um, so this document will be um, sent out um, once everything is finalized, uh, but thank you, John, uh, for putting that together. And then I know that we have uh, Dr. Schlafer here, who's gonna join us and kind of facilitate some Q and A, but feel free to chime in as well, folks. Yeah, I'm happy. I'm monitoring the chat here. I'm happy to take questions, uh, field questions that folks may have. Maybe while we give folks a minute to pop in their questions. Oh, here we go. We've got a, a great one. If parental rights are terminated, what can the parent do to get them back? I think this is a very common question. Um, so maybe we can start there um, because there's some great other questions here about working with substance treatment facilities. So let's take this question about parental rights being terminated. And then I'm just gonna ask that you also tag on a question here regarding the differences, because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding here. The differences between a transfer of legal custody and, and what can unfold after a TLC versus a, a termination of parental rights, a TPR, and what can and can unfold after that. And then we'll take the rest of the, the great questions that are in that person's comments. All right. Who wants to tackle this one, folks? I don't want to. I'll, st I'll start we go. if you want to. So um, I think I, I will start with what's the difference between the two. Um, so a termination of parental rights is actually severing all parental bonds. So that parent is no longer considered a parent and it frees that child for adoption. And basically to, for that child to have new legal parents. And so there really is no ties to that parent or family again, and that child is able to be adopted. Now, once the termination of parental rights goes through, typically there's, I say typically, because there's always an exception, there's not um, an avenue to really undo that. Unless you go through an appeals process or whatnot, there was some new legislation a couple of years back that talked about if a child has not been adopted yet, and it's within a certain time frame. I apologize. I don't know all of the legalities that a parent could request to have their parental rights reinstated. But there, I don't know of any cases in Stearns County where that has happened. I'm sure it has happened throughout Minnesota. It's it's rare. And so I'm going to basically say typically a, a termination is is final, and there is really no way to undo that, um, and that child would be adopted. Now a transfer of physical and legal custody is a little bit different. And now a transfer of legal and physical custody could be to a relative or it could be to a non-relative. We're typically seeing them to relatives though. Um, and what that does is that transfers custody to that relative. It does not sever the parental bond or rights to that parent. And sometimes even in transfer of custody orders, there are some visitation with the biological parents still ordered into there as long as it's safe and appropriate. And so there could still maintain some contact and whatnot. And sometimes the, the biological parent then would be ordered to pay child support to that new guardian. Um, so I'm just gonna use grandparents potentially as the new guardians under the transfer of custody. Um, but what is really important to note about a transfer of custody is that after two years of that transfer of custody order, 
the biological parent is able to petition the court and ask to regain custody back. And so sometimes that's a selling factor for, um, for parents and say, okay, right now my life's not together. I agree to let the, the children go and live with grandparents under a transfer of custody. I'm not losing my rights, um, but I need some time, more time to get things together. And so there's pros and cons of that because we've seen some parents take some more time and get their things together and be able to get regain custody back, some that don't. Um, but a con can also be just making you think big picture is that is that really permanency for a child? Right? I mean, if the, are they, okay, I'm going to live with grandma and grandpa, but then 2 years later, oh, I'm going to go back with mom and dad. So, there, there are some pros and cons to all of the options, of course, um, but those are the big differences with the 2. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think that answers that question, Lacey. I just want to add one more thing to that because I think this is also a common misconception that I hear with incarcerated parents. That is, there was a TLC and then they're going to repetition after two years. But the law, and correct me if I'm wrong, states that um, the petitioning parent would need to be in a better position to take custody of that child than its current placement, right? And so um, the court does consider whether or not that would be that would be in the child's best interest to have the biological parent, the one who's petitioning to regain custody. So that can be a hard burden um, for parents who may have experienced tremendous challenges in the past to meet, um, particularly if they're with two stable grandparents where, where, where everything is together, if you will. Um, do you want to briefly, because I think it's these, these distinctions are really important between a uh, transfer of legal custody and a termination of parental rights. And one of the other things that I see pretty commonly with incarcerated mothers um, is a delegation of parental authority. So do you want to just talk about a little bit the, the distinction between a DOPA um, and these other child protection pathways to permanency? So as child protection workers, we are not legally... <laughs> Um, advocating to do a DOPA, our county attorney's office is suggesting that that's not an actual permanency option, but it it is a very realistic, being transparent, it's a very realistic option for parents. And so we do help support parents that want to sign a DOPA, the Delegation of Parental Authority, um, so that we don't have to have a placement and we don't have to have a formalized court process. And so we as county workers cannot facilitate that because we are not attorneys. But we can assist families in getting them the resources to do that um, prior to any like so if if a, if a parent knows they're going to be incarcerated coming up soon and grandma and grandpa want to care for the child, they the, that parent can sign a delegation of parental authority to the grandparents to have them take care of the children for a certain period of time. The dopas are usually good for one year, but you can always sign them or re-sign them again. Um, and really the DOPA gives that other party the ability to really do anything except for marriage or adoption, I believe. <laughs> so they can sign for school, they can sign for medical, they can do all of those things. Now here I am being the pro and con person again, there, that's some really good pros. The cons are that that DOPA can be ripped up and, and rescinded at any moment, leaving that child kind of without a potential caregiver. So there's pros and cons to every option here too. And I would just point, yeah. I would just add to that, that um, I've seen those work really well, uh, but both parties have to be in agreement to that as well. So I've also seen where, you know, mom, dad, they have CD issues or something going on, they get incarcerated, they come up with this plan, they sign a DOPA, uh, hey, my parents are going to watch this kid while I'm incarcerated, uh, but then they start to make some ripples and make not great choices with that relative, um, such that the relative goes, I'm not going to keep doing this because they feel like um, everything has to be done the parents way still, but it's really all occurring in their house and they don't love that. Um, and so I have seen relatives who have accepted this delegation of parental authority, then say, I'm done doing this and, and essentially bring the kids to our attention and say, hey, um, you need to take these kids because we can't do this. Yeah, so I, think, I think this is a really important piece. And I think this is one of the challenges that we see with uh, kinship caregivers and informal placements a lot with um, 
uh, in the context of parental incarceration and often because those uh, more informal placements, which can be really beneficial for sort of keeping kids out of the child protection system, right, for a variety of reasons, also are um, come with very few, there are child only grants, right, and other financial resources, but Imagine taking custody of a brand new baby that has just been born through a delegation of parental authority and all of the challenges that come with the financial challenges, the emotional challenges, um, different than a formal placement through foster care where there might be some additional resources um, to the family and some additional services to the kids. So really um, important there. I want to, I'm acknowledging that there are some really great questions on this topic. So let's hang here um, and keep thinking about this particular issue, and then I'll circle back to the, the questions that came up earlier regarding substance treatment facilities. So Adam asks a great question here. What challenges are you seeing regarding screening, assessment, jurisdiction, and DOPAs? Um, don't get me started on page 34 of the screening, 35 of the screening guidelines. <laughs> <laughs> but I would, well, the, the stance that we've taken is that um, the screening guidelines talk about someone with authority to care. And a DOPA gives somebody the authority to care. So if the child is living with grandma, if, if the parent, if the custodial parent is in Stearns County, and sorry, Adam, if the grandma has a DOPA and lives in Benton County, I and there's an allegation, let's say on grandma, that I, there, that I would say that needs to go to Benton County. That child resides in Benton County with somebody who has authority to care. That's my interpretation of the screening guidelines. Um, so, but yes, it is. It is a cha it's a challenge all the time, and um, and you know, I think that's where the relationships are great between counties, and we can have those conversations and talk through it and talk it out. Anything anyone else wants to add about the uh, two pathways to permanency in terms of thinking about TLCs and TPRs and then this different um, approach in terms of DOPAs? I did want to mention what Sherry said um, from Olmstead County is um, in Stearns County as well, when a parent petitions for custody back under a transfer of custody, we are assigning a social worker as well to do that assessment and, and report back to our county attorney's office so they can either support or not support that. And we've had them go both ways as well. We've had some where parents get the children back after our assessment and some that do not. Um, and as you mentioned earlier, the, the burden of proof is on the parent and it's pretty, it is pretty high. Thanks for that. And thanks for that comment, Sherry. So let's back up here. There's a, a couple of questions here related to the intersection with substance treatment facilities. So um, how much do you and your county work with substance uh, treatment facilities and the counselors there to check in on parents' progress? Um, and if chemical dependency treatment is needed, uh, sort of how do the referrals work? Does that get ordered? Are there referrals? What if somebody's already volunteer vol voluntarily engaging in treatment? Um, so maybe we could talk about this intersection a bit here. I would say um, typically when we have a case where there is CD treatment or substance use abuse concerns, uh, it is something that we will ask if we have involvement with the court to have ordered. Uh, in terms of if a parent is already doing that voluntarily, uh, we love that. We look at that as a win because now we have a parent who's already taken those steps. Um, and, and in terms of how the court views that, I think they view it the same way. It looks like hey, the parent is, is insightful into the things that they're struggling with and they're working on it. And I, there's nothing cooler than a parent who is in that mindset, especially when we're talking about chemical use and abuse, correct? Just, Will? Well, I, I can jump into it unless Will wants to, but just real quick, you know, obviously regarding working with the treatment centers and referrals, um, anytime we have a parent who's engaging in treatment, especially if it's part of their case plan, we should be in regular communication with the treatment center, whether it's an outpatient or residential treatment center, uh, regarding the progress, the steps that they're taking, you know, the ups, the downs, the good, the bad, the ugly. And then regarding referrals, um, I'll just be transparent. Um, I came from the, from the corrections side and, uh, I had, you know, there's different philosophies in life and the philosophy about, you know, making those referrals, are we handholding the parents too much? 
And uh, in the past 18 months, it's really been a, an eye opener to me, especially as we start talking about like reasonable efforts. Everybody probably has different interpretations. And I can tell you, even across the United States, I recently read an article regarding like reasonable efforts and how differently it's interpreted across the states. You know, in Minnesota, if we're working with a client, they're struggling with chemical dependency, they can make the referral themselves. If they're struggling to make the referral, our social workers, case aides, any of our supervisors, any of our staff who are engaging with these families can certainly jump in, assist, and we actually should be making some of those referrals if the families aren't making that progress, which has been um, a real eye opener to me um, because you kind of go back and forth, like how much is too much handholding, how much is not enough, um, but realistically looking at some of the case law and things like that that are out there, we do have an obligation to make those referrals in most cases if we need to. Nick, I want to come back to this uh, topic of uh, referring to inpatient treatment or to, I mean, I'm thinking about inpatient treatment in particular and the long time uh, lags that it can often take between, um, you know, potentially referring for a chemical dependency assessment. So perhaps a judge says, you know, uh, they order a chemical de dependency ses assessment, a rule 25 and follow recommendations and how long, right? So then maybe um, inpatient treatment is recommended or chemical dependency treatment is recommended ended and there might not be beds available there might not be programs available what's happening with the child protection clock at that point in time because i think this is one of the things that's really challenging for our families who have a lot of uh, a lot of challenges um and then the clock is ticking while you all are working to um get supports for for families in place yeah certainly lacy do you want to take this question or do you want me to jump in on it i can take it so the, the clock doesn't stop ticking, unfortunately, but it could be a reason to extend permanency. And so as long as there's good communication with our county attorney's office and quite honestly, our defense attorneys guardian ad litems that, oh my goodness, we had to wait 60 days for this person to even get their chemical assessment. Um, that's no fault of their own. It's a, a systems issue, right? And so while we are working hard on our reasonable efforts and the parents are working hard, and no fault to really anybody, it gets delayed 60 days. I could see it being um, a request to extend permanency based on that. Um, but it's the reality of the world that we live in right now and the lack of access to services. Um, but if somebody is court ordered, we are, like Nick was saying, we are going to, I guess, hold hands and help them make those referrals and do that for them um because we are held to the standard of reasonable or active efforts in an ICWA case so we are going to do those things we're going to make referrals uh, but yes the first step would be a CD assessment and then then we would get a recommendation for what if they need outpatient or inpatient and then go from there I think one thing just to touch off of uh, what Lacey's talked about as well is obviously the wait times, you know, um, addressing the client's needs. You have a person who's incarcerated. Do we have an ability um, to use our multidisciplinary teams to sometimes expedite those things so that the parent can, you know, leave incarceration and begin making progress on their case so that hopefully they can be reunified with their child? <laughs> and that's really where sometimes the importance of that communication uh, between the parents who's incarcerated, the jail staff and child protection staff is really going to be valuable so that those things don't get hung up or lost. That client doesn't get lost. And quite honestly, you know, working with like our mental health community action team, that's where we did see some of those clients getting lost. They're waiting for treatment. No one's following up with treatment. No one's arranging the transportation, making sure it's arranged, making sure that the court orders are signed so that they can be released to those programs. And those things are really, really important and valuable. Um, so it's, I, I think that's where those collaborations come in, those communications and quite honestly, through a lot of our multidisciplinary teams that we work with, if we have someone who's stuck and our timelines are getting tight, we have those relationships where we can pick up the phone and call central Minnesota and say, Hey, here we have, you know, John Doe, uh, or, or Jane Doe, who's, who's currently incarcerated. They're set to be out in the next, you know, 48 hours. If we don't get this assessment done, the likelihood of it not being done and pushing things down the road is going to be critical and we can sometimes systematically navigate getting those services in place so that we don't lose the clients along the way, whether it's they're lost in the criminal justice system or essentially they take off and disappear upon being released. So we can have some of those things in place to help them be successful. And it takes away some of that anxiety, which leads to them making poor choices. Yeah, and I just wanna mention, um, you know, our, and I don't know exactly where the program is at now, but I know at one point we started a program called the intensive family treatment program with our, in our county. 
uh, where we had partnered with Effective Living in St. Cloud and with CentraCare. Um, and we were getting clients through that program that were court ordered to participate and, and having some um, preference in terms of getting them started in treatment. And again, like Nick said, it's building that rapport, right? And it's having those connections. But I can tell you a personal example that I had of a client I worked with who um, she and her husband both were in court order to participate in this program. Kids were placed with grandpa or grandma for the time being. Um, dad got into treatment. He was in, he was doing well, um, and they were together. Um, she did not get in and, and we would have, um, we would, I mean, we would meet with those clients a couple times a week, but we would have those clients come to our office once a week and they were doing essentially a group, which we counted toward their uh, chemical use and abuse treatment in terms of it's a it's a group. They're going to a group. They're going to a an event such as an NA or an AA kind of event. Um, but the cool thing was our community partnership then had Centra Care uh, or Effective Living staff that participated in that, and they would cater that group to the clients we had in the group, which was awesome. But I remember saying to that worker from Centra Care at the time, "Hey, um, this lady is not in treatment." She, she showed up to the, the meeting with a hoodie on that she had closed down to this tight. She was just down, looking down, no contact, not doing well. She wanted treatment still, but she couldn't get into it. And I remember during our break in that group saying to one of the people from Centric Care, hey, this lady needs to get in. I mean, she, she is struggling right now to not just fall clear off the wagon, like who cares? What's the point? You know, uh, and she was able during that break to get her a spot. And I remember uh, that was like on a Tuesday, right? Uh, Monday, I went to see her at the treatment facility and I didn't recognize her because she wasn't wearing a hoodie. She had done her makeup. She had, I mean, I literally almost walked right past her. So I think it is a very real issue that we have with regard to resources. I know it ebbs and flows and whatnot, but certainly when it comes to the court and our involvement, if a parent is making effort and it's our system that's holding them up, we are going to advocate for them. Just wanted to say one additional thing is there are some treatment facilities throughout Minnesota, I'm sure other other places too that um, have the ability to have children in treatment with them, and so we do try to utilize those. I mean, there's. I asked that exact question Lacey. <laughs> thanks for that yep um none of them of course are local um but they there there are the facilities and each facility has their different criteria for when they can have their children with them but we really try to utilize those facilities when we can um especially for parents with young children because we know that that um, first bond is so important um and we then can typically do a trial home visit to that parent while they're in treatment with with their child and get them because of the treatment by nature is then a safe environment. And so we removed any safety factors that parent is clean. They're in treatment. That child can be there with them. Um, and we still have the our kind of back safety of a trial home visit that should anything go awry that we could pull that back should we need to. I will say too, one other thing that I thought of, which is a barrier for some people is we will have clients who will say, yep, I want to do this. I want to, I want to get treatment. I want to get help, but I'm only willing to go to this place to do it. And what happens is, and I'm not going to name any names, but there are places that are not, that don't give us as solid of a, a CD eval. And sometimes when the client is not real motivated, uh, I've experienced them saying, this is the only place I'll go. And maybe that place has a long wait because word is out. You can go there and potentially not get as severe of a assessment outcome, you know? Um, and so those are times where we, you know, like if I have a client who says, Hey, I can get in, but it's going to be four weeks at this place. I may recommend to them that they call. Central Minnesota Mental Health Center, or they call wherever I can find that can get them in sooner. Um, and I will certainly tell the court, or I have in the past, that, hey, look, 
I've got this parent and yep, it looks on the surface like they're willing to be cooperative, but they're only willing to do it on their terms. And it has to be this place, which has the longest wait. That's not great. I mean, I, I want, you know, we want to move that ball along. Right, and has really important implications for their timeline and ultimately working to get their kids back. That's the goal. Um, mm -hmm. I'm mindful of time, so I want to ask this last question and give you each an opportunity to respond to it. I'm curious, um, and you can you can take this in whichever direction you, you want in terms of how you want to respond, but if there was one piece of, of guidance or a, a magic wand that you could each have in terms of facilitating better, stronger partnerships uh, for incarcerated parents that are also involved with child protection, whether that's you know, on the jail side or your side, um, in order to really more fully support these parents. I think that the evidence is very clear that when there are families involved in both of these systems, um, they are often in, have been marginalized in many ways along the path and have tremendous trauma histories. Um, so what's one thing uh, that you wish could be a little bit easier in these partnerships and where, or, or where do you see opportunities for, for making this a bit better? Nick, do you wanna start? Uh, yeah, I certainly can start. And uh, this is actually a really thought provoking question. Um, you know, to me, number one, I think if I had a magic wand, we could get everybody who's working with and serving the families to see a met promise. Um, you know, many times, and I'm going to just throw this out there, a lack of better term. I've heard these terms. I've heard these terms when I've been in jails. I've heard these terms when I've been in prisons. And those persons are dirtbag. They did this. They did that. Most of the time is the person had one bad day, one bad choice in a decision that was probably impaired by either mental illness or a substance use that has caused them to do that. I think the other magic wand that I would have is that we stop the blame and shame game and collaborate and communicate more openly so that everybody has a good understanding of our systems. I think as we open those doors of communication, break down the silos, systematically, we're going to work better to um, serve not only the families and children that we serve, but serve our communities and the professionals that we collaborate with the best. My, my thought on it is uh, when I've worked with clients who are incarcerated, and they have a case manager, I don't know this person, right? And I don't mean the case manager, I mean the client. I don't know this client, I just got this client. The case manager, in my opinion, then is the expert. Um, and there are times where I've had case managers I reach out to and man, we communicate and it is like, things are clicking. We can, I can say, hey, what's going on with this? Or they'll say, hey, so-and-so had a bad day at group in this group or whatever. And, and I think it's powerful because again, we can reiterate each other's message. I don't know about you, but I know that um, sometimes as, as much as I like to think I'm really great at things, it takes me a few times hearing it, right? So I think when we can have a, a coordinated effort about what needs to happen, that's powerful for clients. And so if I had a magic wand, it would be, uh, I know when they're when I get a client if they are involved first of all right away. Uh, second of all, that we have those open lines of communication where we can really work on those things. Because again, I'm not the expert. I don't claim to be the expert. And and I think uh, you know, um, I I think having someone else who can also convey the message that I don't want your kids. You know, I think so often child protection is, oh, you're out to get my kids. Uh, there's there's literally rumors that, hey, you get more money if you take more kids, which is not true. Um, and I, I love kids or I wouldn't do what I do, but I have my own two and I'm good with that. Two is enough for me right here. So I don't want anyone's kids. I want them to be with their parents because all the studies show that's the best place for them if we can make it work where we can achieve safety and have that be there. So that would be my, I would love. Thanks for those reflections. Uh, Lacey or Will, and I know we're getting close on time. So if you wanna keep your remarks short, we'll transition off. I'll, I'll be quick. I honestly, um, it's a little, not as big picture, but I would like a, if we know that a um, incarcerated parent is involved with child protection, I would like them to, um, this magic wand, so bear with me, have a specialized like section of uh, prison or jail that they can actually do their case plan things. Have the case, have the um, the topics for them, have the, um, the classes available to them because that seems to be a barrier. Oh, they can't do this class because they haven't reached this goal. 
um, maybe we can give some special circumstances to those parents to help them because then if they're getting out on the tail end of the child protection case, now they have to do all of that work at the tail end. Can we really collaborate and work together to get them those services while they're in jail? That's my magic wand. I love that. Prioritizing parents with active child protection case plans. I think that's critically important. Uh, Will. Yeah, mine's quick. Mine's quick. And I think it's it would help just achieve all the things that Lacey, Andy, and Nick have said. But it would be what that tip sheet recommends, which is have a liaison in both in every jail and every single social services agency that is designated to uh, communicate with each other so that we can achieve those open lines of communication. Um, and so if we you know, the magic wand would be just all of a sudden, boom, they're all there in all of the uh, jails and social services agencies um, throughout the state. Right. Nobody wants duplicating services. Nobody wants to be not having clear lines of communication. And I think that what you all have revealed today is just all of the ways that when families are intersecting with both of these systems, uh, there needs to be collaboration. Um, and when there's not, it's the families that we're failing, right? It's the children and the families that we're failing who are not getting what they need to be successful. Um, and I think really important issues that you've raised here. I just want to draw people's attention in the last two minutes. Please take um, the quick feedback survey. Please reach out if you've got questions. Um, thank you to our presenters today. Um, we heard this pr presentation uh, a couple months ago now, but it was great hearing again. I learned something every time. Thanks for your time and energy and commitment to this work. Um, and Nick, thank especially to, um, to your thoughts in the end here about really just thinking about these families as, as families of promise and recognizing that we all are um, more than the worst thing we've ever done. So, Anna, anything else before we wrap? Oh, that's all. No, just uh, again, thank you very much for all of your um, words of wisdom and and um, we'll be posting this on our website. We'll be sharing the tip sheet with those who registered. Feel free to share it with anyone else. Um, and if you have other thoughts, we can always edit that tip sheet and, and, and um, keep building on it. So, um, if other thoughts come to mind, please, please let us know. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate your time today and thanks for being with us. Take good care, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Bye. I hope you get your magic wand. <laughs> you can pretend you have it. Just stop pausing. Okay. <laughs>